Well, hi, real people. Hi, the internet. Um, let me remind you of the first step of meditation, which of course is to turn off your phone. And I'll set a 40 minute timer here. And so we'll start out as we usually do, with the attention on the breath. As I often say, one really nice thing about the breath is it's pretty easy to know whether you're doing what you meant to be or not. When you lose your mindfulness and then it comes back, you'll immediately know you were on the breath or you were in. So I think it's a pretty nice way to settle in. And if you're new to meditating in loud environments like the mission, my favorite thing to do is, is let all the outside sounds be a mindfulness bell. It can be pretty hard to let go of your own thoughts. It's pretty easy to let go of that motorcycle. That wasn't a very good song. I found it easy to let go of that. in the Dharma circles that I run in. Uh, I think a lot of my students think of the Dharma as like a way to create awesome states of consciousness. This is certainly not how the Buddha taught the Dharma. The Buddha said the, the point is decrease tanha, decrease trying to control things in stupid ways, trying to control things you can't control, and this cuts out your stress. So any like a time you find yourself wishing we're meditating up in the mountains or even someplace like Berkeley where it's not quite as loud, that sort of controlling things in ways you can't, you can't all get up and, and move to the mountains. That's a really useful thing to work with. And in Buddhism, that's the core thing to work with. There's many ways to work with it. One example is that cultivating gratitude. How lucky we are to be in a the city. These sounds, we could see them as irritating, as disrupting the practice. You can all see them as super helpful. We often hear the family that lives upstairs, and it's very easy not to care about what they're watching on TV. It distracts you, and you come right back. Thanks, TV. What an easy distraction to work with.
And so tonight we're going to be working with uh, open awareness types of practices. These are harder than focus attention practices. Harder in that if you get lost, it's not quite so easy to remember what it was you were supposed to be doing. Harder in that what the mind normally does, if left to its own devices untrained, is bounce around. And so when we invite the mind to bounce around, it's a little hard to tell, like, how is this different from not meditating? So it's more advanced practice to be able to hold an open awareness or hold a non-stable attention. So if you're pretty new at this, or if this evening you have the mind state of somebody who is pretty new at this, no matter how long you've been doing this, feel free to just stay with your breathing. If you'd like to go into these more challenging practices, what I'd like you to try next is let go of the breath and let the attention go where it wants. This might actually result in just staying on the breath. More commonly, it's going to result in bouncing around. And unless you have quite a lot of experience working with mental talk with your, your thoughts, hearing your own voice in your head, I would not go there. I would mostly keep uh, the attention bouncing around the body. If you know how to do images, those aren't quite as hard as talk. But talking to yourself in your head, unless, you're, unless you have some training in it, you just get very quickly lost in talking. So let the attention bounce primarily to different feelings. So these will mostly be in your body, they might be in your head. And what we're going to be working on tonight is there are two opposite schools of thought on how to meditate. One is to cultivate core competencies. So most of American meditation comes from that school. So learning how to focus on your breath, how to cultivate positive mind states, how to deconstruct things through Vipassana. And there's another school that says all of this is just doing and wanting and grasping and ego. And it's actually better to just sit there and not really do anything. Do very little. So we're going to move in that direction. So as the attention bounces, instead of the usual noting practice you might do, I'd actually like you to just note the word yes for each sensation. And what we mean by that word yes is, this one's great, this one's fine, this one is welcome, this one doesn't need to change. Just affirming that this is what it is. So the attention might stabilize, it might bounce. We'll just try to pull it out of mental talk. And about every two seconds, just notice what you're focusing on and say yes. It seems you almost can't find a meditation teacher who doesn't Give a similar speech around, you know, accepting everything and, and your stress is good and your anger is good. And in meditation, we're just going to let all of these things in. And no matter how many times you get that advice, it's very hard to put into practice when it's you in the moment. Well, sure, some things are acceptable. It doesn't all have to be great, but not this, not this. The idea of yes, we we'll just see what's going on particularly what's going on in our feelings and our body. And we just invite it to keep going.
And if you do wind up in thoughts, just label that yes and let it go. The goal is to keep out of there, but that's the place you're going to go when you get stuck. It's not possible to turn the thoughts off without months of meditation. Or at least turn them off for very long. It's not possible to keep the attention perfectly stable for most of us without a couple days of meditation. So the thoughts are going to go, the attention is going to drift there. We'll just label that a yes. Of course that happens. That's fine. I'm going to call the centerpiece of the Dharma. Is don't control things in ways they can't be controlled. That's what's causing all this stress. I'm trying to turn the thoughts off. Yeah, that's not how it works disliking your feelings and hoping you get different ones. That's not what causes different feelings. I often like to talk about meditation as an anti-healing practice. Uh, uh, of course, healing comes from meditation. Probably most of us have experienced that. But the anti-healing is, is especially in periods where you're not feeling good or things aren't going well. It's like always trying to make it better, trying to make it better. In meditation, uh, you're pretty actively trying not to make it better. Just leave it alone. That can feel really nice, giving yourself the freedom uh, to just exist. Of course, this isn't a life philosophy. You shouldn't take all the problems that you see and, and leave them alone in your life. But it's a pretty nice thing to be able to do from time to time, to leave them alone. To just say yes. Yes, you exist. Yes, that's happening. So I, I started us for a few minutes on the breath, which uh, I like as a way to settle in. 
But for this sort of just accept practice, it can be a little confusing. In the breath practice, you don't just accept. You accept whatever is happening and try to put it in the background and feel your breath. In this, we even accept the distraction. If you just space out, don't do anything about that. Just say yes. And for the last part of the meditation, we're going to do a practice that, a very simple practice, so a lot of traditions have discovered slash invented it. I like to use the Japanese name Shikantaza, because I, I think that word only means one thing. And the Shikantaza practice is one where what you try to do is just relax the mind what that feels like is dropping all objects of attention. So the simpler set of instructions would be anytime you notice the mind is engaged with something, just drop that thing. I was saying these, these practices are harder than focus attention. This one is particularly hard if you're new at meditation. And then you really will end up uh, not meditating at all. 
So if you're uh, half asleep or something, um, don't do this one. The more complicated instruction, more complicated in that uh, if you're newer at meditation, it may not make a whole lot of sense, it is around actually the size of consciousness. Sometimes the mind, the self, it feels really big. And then when it gets too involved with some object of consciousness, it feels really small. And so if this idea of the size of consciousness makes any sense, the instruction I would give for Shikantaza is to relax the mind every time it shrinks. When you relax it, it should get bigger. Particularly when you relax the muscles in your head, the mind tends to get bigger. So you can see how the idea of yes was warming us up for this. Yes isn't focused uh, on a particular object, but it is narrow. It's looking at this thing and that thing. But this idea of just accept everything, don't change anything, this is what we're looking for in Shikantaza. But it's one step farther. Don't even get involved with it. I said this was a more advanced practice. But the directions are not advanced. The directions are something like just let go. Uh, Michael Taft used to use the phrase opening the fist. The way that if your fist is closed, that's an action to close it. And it's a relaxation to open the fist. We do this with the mind. The other analogy he used for this is dropping the ball. Whatever you're doing, just stop. The thing that's advanced about this is uh, it, you could imagine it being possible to spend a lot of time doing this without getting a lot of benefit. If you're brand new to meditation, I could see that being easier. But this practice itself is very simple. Part of why I say this is one of the Probably the biggest distraction for most of my students is thinking about meditation. Talking to yourself in your head about whether you're doing it right and what insight you just had and so on. So if that happens, we, we do the same thing. Just ignore it. Just drop it. Don't care about it.
you might get this same sort of relaxed feeling every time there's something going on and you just say, none of my business. I don't have to do anything about that. Honey, I liked that song. I'm finding it harder to let go of. <laughs> This practice isn't the total cessation of effort. A total cessation of effort would be something like just sit there. We do have one task here. There's one thing we do over and over. But the, the effort should feel really low. All we're doing is just making sure we don't solve any problems. Almost like being a, a security guard and just let everybody come in or go out. <laughs> just abdicate your position. Your force of habit might be to 
jump down and ask somebody for ID and what they're doing there. Just everybody comes in, everybody goes out. If they want to steal something, fine. Takes a little bit of effort to remember to use the mind in this pretty unusual way.